Um, welcome to CHC. How many of you have been here before for one of our community ed sessions? Okay, there's a few hands out there. And how many of you are familiar with CHC in general? A few more hands, great. So um, I'm going to, oh, so, sorry, my name is Cindy Lopez. And um, I'm the Director of Community Connections here at CHC. And Community Connections is the group at CHC that's responsible for our community education and engagement work. So um, sessions like this, and if you've been to other community ed sessions, and we do them on-site and some off-site as well, we come to you. So, um, so just a little bit more about, about CHC. We've been here, it's been our privilege to be here in our local community for over 65 years. Um, and we serve children, teens, and young adults, and it's all, and we're all about all of these great things, helping them develop grit and resilience and make friends and realize their dreams. Um, we are also all about removing barriers, so we're committed to bringing more resources to more people. So tonight's session is about um, having Barbara here and um, sharing that resource with you and a kind of a different approach to learning. So we're all about making sure that people have the information that they need to make good decisions about their lives and their kids. Um, we consider the whole child when we're, when we're um, working with when we are working um, with our children, teens, and young adults. And we have four areas of excellence, ADHD, learning differences, or LD, uh, anxiety and depression, and autism. And then we do this through several different, in several different ways. We have two schools and our clinical services and then community connections. We we'll also want you to know that CHC is inclusive. So all people are welcome here and it's a safe place. So on that note, I'm going to introduce, we're excited to have Barbara um, Aerosmith Young here tonight to share her story and, um, and the Aerosmith approach with you. We're also, oh, and on your chairs, um, Barbara was kind enough to provide a copy of her book for you um, and she'll be signing those at the end of the evening if you're um, wanting signing and we'll do that right up here. We're also um, privileged to have Jo Bowler here with us tonight, who she's going to introduce Barbara. Jo is um, from Stanford, um, does amazing work around growth, set, growth mindset and mathematics. And um, she, I do have a slide up here, there you go. And a whole bunch of other things, and there's just a few of the, her accomplishments up on that slide. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Jo. Oh, Jo, one more thing, she also has her book here this evening, and they'll be selling this right outside the door, and she can sign this for you as well if you're interested. So, on that note, I will turn it over. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's great to see you. Um, so, I probably don't need to tell you that Barbara is the founder of the Aerosmith program, and that's actually been running for about 40 years in different countries. And she's really a visionary who believes in all children and does work to make sure that they're successful. I read this book a few years ago, um, and I was so taken by it, I went to visit her school in Toronto twice, actually. And we interviewed people there. It was really amazing to see the work she was doing with people. And a couple of people I interviewed, I actually talk about it in my new book, uh, Limitless Mind. One was a lawyer, an adult, who came to Aerosmith because... Uh, lawyers are billed for their time, and she was always being pulled up for being too slow and billing all these different hours. So she went to Aerosmith, and she said it, everything changed for her. And what really struck me, she talked about how she was now making sense of events that had happened in her life years ago that hadn't made sense to her at the time. Um, there was a family there who talked about their two sons, and one of them had had learning differences and always lost arguments with his brother, uh, had gone to the program, and now suddenly was reasoning and on par with his brother making arguments. So anyway, amazing things. We met lots of kids. I know a lot of kids who have really been broken down by our school system um, that values such a narrow uh, little way of achieving that go to Barbara's school and just come out as change people. So Barbara's an inspiration to me. She's also the recipient of the 
2019 Leaders and Legends Innovation Award from the University of Toronto. So it's pretty amazing. And it's really a great pleasure to introduce her tonight. So I'll hand over to you, Barbara. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, I just apologize. I have a bit of a cold. Um, I promise it's not the coronavirus. So, <laughs> yeah, but uh, so hopefully my my voice will hold up. But I'd like to thank Joe for that um, wonderful introduction. And if people haven't read her book Limitless Mind, it's a really really powerful read. So I would highly recommend that uh, people explore that. And I would also like to thank Rosalie Whitlock for um, inviting me to present, and Cindy Lopez as well uh, from CHC here. So I just feel really honored. Um, you know, walking into this environment it, it is so children-centered, and it just feels like a really safe and positive place for for children. So thank you for allowing me to be here tonight and and talk about my work. And I think I need the clicker. So um, I'm passionate about the human brain. And uh, it's this incredible organ that we really can't escape, like we carry it with us everywhere we go. And it's incredible complexity and it's incredible capacity for change. Um, my life and my work has really been an exploration of the territory of the human brain and how it shapes who we are. Uh, it filters our perceptions and our understanding of ourself, uh, also our perceptions and understanding of other people and of our world and our relationship to that world. And to me what's so promising, yes our brain shapes who we are, but this concept of neuroplasticity tells us that if we can understand and utilize those principles, we can actually shape our brain. Um, so tonight I'd like to take you on a little bit of a journey into the world of the brain. Uh, and it's a personal journey and it's also a universal journey. The personal is my story uh, of my struggles with my learning difficulties and what led to creating this work. And it's universal in that each and every one of us has a brain. And the cognitive profile of our strengths and weaknesses does shape um, who we are and how we engage in the world. So where did I start from? Oops. I started here. So when I started in grade one in the late 1950s, this was a time of the pre-neuroplastic paradigm. So in grade one, I was identified as having a mental block because the term learning difference, learning difficulty, learning disability, the various terms that get used, didn't exist at that point. So I overheard my grade one teacher tell my mother that I had a mental block and one of my problems was being quite concrete. So I actually thought I had a wooden cube in my head that made learning difficult. And later I was to learn, no, I didn't have a piece of wood in my head, but I had blockages in my brain that made learning challenging. And I overheard my grade one teacher tell my mother not to have high expectations for her daughter. Um, that really all of my schooling was going to be a struggle. So I really feel like in grade one, I was given a life sentence of, of struggle. And certainly, pretty much most of my schooling uh, was challenging. I don't think, if I look back on it, there really wasn't much joy uh, in going to school. And my, the school was right across the street from my house. So I could look out the, the living room window and see the school. And there was never a time when I left my house to walk across that street where I had a bounce in my step. It was always knowing that whatever was going to face me in that class was going to be, uh, was going to be a struggle. And later, I came to understand you know, the, the different difficulties that I had, their source was in my brain, and I had multiple learning difficulties. So I struggled to process language, to understand relationships, to understand concepts. Um, if somebody said, you know, it's raining out, I could understand that because I could conjure up a visual image of rain. But as soon as it got abstract at all, I couldn't understand. So my notebooks were filled with pictures. I would draw diagrams or use my right hemisphere to try to understand language. It was almost as if, I mean, I heard the words, but like the part of my brain that translates those words into meaning wasn't working properly. So making decisions was really hard for me, like to weigh alternatives, to compare and contrast. I got identified in grade one and pretty much through most of my schooling as being rigid and being stubborn. And truly I was rigid and stubborn, but not coming from an emotional place, it was cognitive. Because for me, if I worked out something, if I grasped something, it was so hard one, and then somebody would say, well think about this over here. 
I would have to let go of this to integrate this other bit of information. And it actually felt like a physical assault. So I would hold on and dig my heels in because it was so hard for me um, cognitively to be able to do that process. Things like um, you know, relational concepts, before and after, bigger and smaller, greater than, less than, those were all really hard because you had to um, see relationships. Something like fractions was really impossible for me. So I could understand one because I could see one thing. I could understand four because I could line up four objects. But as soon as you put that one over a four, it's a relationship of a part to a whole. It didn't mean anything to me. I was vulnerable to con artists because one of the ways you know you're being conned is you hear logical inconsistencies in what people are saying. For me, there was no logic in my world, so there were no logical inconsistencies. I struggled um, with jokes, right? Because to understand a joke, there's irony. Um, so I would learn to laugh when other people did because I didn't want to feel left out, but I certainly didn't understand what they were laughing at. So this was one area of, of difficulty that I had. And as I said, I had multiple areas of difficulty. So I also, uh, the part of my brain that registers the location of sensation on the left side of my body was not working well. So most people, if you put your hand on a hot burner, your brain tells you pain. So my brain would tell me pain, but it wouldn't register the location of the pain. So if I didn't look, I would leave my hand on the hot burner, which was not really a good idea. So I didn't really register location of sensation. So I was really uncoordinated, uh, you know, that word klutz. Um, I was pretty klutzy. And my mother used to kind of joke that she figured, you know, I'd be dead by the age of five because I was so accident prone. So that was another area that was problematic. And then I couldn't understand three-dimensional space. So things like geography or geometry was challenging for me. Um, even as a child crossing a street, because as you're crossing the street, you're creating a spatial map of where you are relative to that car. And I, I couldn't do that. So I created strategies. I would walk blocks out of my way to find a stop sign or a stoplight where I knew the cars had to stop and I'd be safe. Or I'd stand at the side of the road and wait for somebody else to cross and hope they didn't have the same difficulty that I had and we would make it across safely. Um, and things like some of these problems are hereditary. So my mother had this difficulty. And I have four brothers. And one of my four brothers had this difficulty. And they operate on a continuum. So my mother and I were at the severe end of the continuum. My brother was probably mild here. And so it was always an adventure. That was my mother's attitude when we got into a car to go anywhere. Because we knew where we were starting. We knew where we were ending. But it was a black hole in between. There were no maps in either of our heads. Um, and she said, well, we'll get there eventually, which we always did. And we never really got there the same way twice. But when I got older and you know, sort of started to understand some of these functions, I asked her, had it ever really impacted her? So she shared with me that she had gone to the University of Manitoba to study chemistry. And in the first year, her professors told her, actually, chemistry is not for you. Because she couldn't do, you know, when you have to build those electrons, and there's a lot of spatial representation in chemistry. So she dropped out of chemistry. So it had had an impact on her life. My one brother that had this at a mild level, he did become a chemist at the University of Toronto um, in the Department of Chemistry. But he went into physical chemistry, not organic chemistry, because it placed less of a load. So I've learned that no part of the brain is irrelevant. If there's, if there's a weakness or a challenge in any area, it will have some impact. And so for me, um, I was very lucky. My mother was an educator. In fact, she had won a, an award in the province of Ontario for her contributions to education, which I have in my office. It's the lamp of learning. Um, and she decided in grade one that I was going to learn how to read, and I was going to learn how to write, and I was going to learn how to do basic mathematics. So I would come home at lunch, and I had flashcards. I would come home after school, and I had flashcards. And uh, she figured out all the ways I was cheating, so you know, I, I really had to learn um, this. So, so I did learn how to read, and I learned how to write, and I learned how to do basic mathematics. But it didn't address, for me, the underlying learning difficulty. I still struggled. And I was lucky in the father that I had. He was an inventor and a scientist and had all sorts of patents. Um, and he had this belief, which he instilled in me. He said, if there's a problem in the world and there's no solution, he said, it's your responsibility to go out and find a solution. And then he said something that I've held near and dear. He said, if the rest of the world tells you you can't do it, he said, don't listen. He said, um, don't be limited by conventional wisdom. He said, this is how science goes forward. So I had this thought in my head that you know, there must be a solution. And um, I was sort of set on a quest. I had 
no spatial maps, I couldn't understand, but, but I had this idea that I had to figure out this challenge. And for me, um, it was in August of 1977, I remember it really well, somebody handed me a book that changed my life. And it was a book written by Alexander Luria, it was uh, The Man with the Shattered World, and it told the story of Leo Zazetsky, a Russian soldier who at the Battle of Smolensk had a very localized head wound. And this book was Zetsky's journal describing what he couldn't do after the wound, and then Lurie explaining what was going on in his brain um, and why he couldn't do those things. So Zetsky had been gifted at mathematics before the wound. Afterwards, he couldn't understand fractions. Um, before the wound, he could tell time. After, he couldn't tell time. I was now 25, 26. I still couldn't read an analog clock. So, for me, this was an aha moment where I realized the learning difficulties I had had their source in my brain. I knew I didn't have a piece of wood or a piece of shrapnel in my brain, but for whatever reason, that part of my brain was not functioning. Um, and we were using the same language in our journal. Uh, we were, were both saying that meaning was ephemeral, it would just disappear into a mist, and that we lived in a fog. So we were using exactly the same language in our respective journals to describe our difficulty. So the first part of a solution is, what's the nature of the problem? Now I had an idea of what the nature of the problem was, what do I do about that? And then maybe some people know Mark Rosenschweig's work, he was at Berkeley, and he was one of the early people looking at neuroplasticity in the 60s. He was doing a lot of research there with rats. And what he found was you put rats in a really enriched environment with lots of stimulation, then they became better learners. So they learned more effectively on mazes. And then he looked at their brains. And he found that the brains had changed physiologically. So they were, he, he hypothesized that the reason they were better at learning was that their brains had changed physiologically. They had more dendrites, so more synaptic connections, increased neurotransmitters, more glia cells, and large capillaries. So that stimulation had led to uh, physiological and functional changes in the brain, which led to better learning. And at that time, I thought, if rats have neuroplasticity, surely humans must have neuroplasticity. And I went to my professors at graduate school, and they all said, no, you know, there is no human neuroplasticity, which now we know there is. But then I thought, my father said, they tell you you can't mm -hmm. do it, <laughs> don't listen to them. Um, and I was desperate at that point. I was now 26, uh, saw no future for myself. So I figured I'm going to go into Lurie's work, try to understand, you know, as he describes these three different areas that I'm struggling with, can I create exercises for them? So there were, you know, three different regions in my brain, went into Luria, thought, okay, what can I do? And I created three very different exercises. And one was using clocks, actually. Not that I wanted to get better at telling time, and actually now I can tell time, but I wanted to make my brain process relationships. Um, and currently we have actually a 10-handed clock. So we start at two hands, go all the way up. And the idea is it's, it's making the person's brain process multiple relationships simultaneously really quickly and accurately. So as I worked through that exercise, and I had no idea if it would work because nobody had done it before, um, I started to see change. After I got to a certain level, I had to keep adding complexity to push um, my brain to process this information and I got up to what I call the four-handed level where I was seeing four relationships simultaneously when I knew there was human neuroplasticity because now I could listen to conversations for the first time in my life. I could actually understand what people were saying when they were speaking which I had never been able to do before and I could actually for the first time in my life I was part of human discourse. I could actually have a conversation that went back and forth whereas before because I had a verbatim auditory memory it was like a little tape recorder I could actually uh, listen to somebody, memorize what they were saying, walk away, try to figure it out, but it could take me two hours, and that person wasn't still standing there, you know, waiting for me to figure it out. And even if they had stood there, it would be a really slow conversation because, you know, I'd figure it out, say something, then take another two hours. Um, so I, I was now living in what I call real time instead of lag time. And then I went back and taught myself all of mathematics. So I started at grade one and went all the way up to college. And now I understood mathematics from first principles, like the logic. And my father was a mathematician and a physicist. And he'd always told me, you know, there's a poetry to mathematics, which I didn't see. But now I actually saw what he was talking about. Um, and now I was no longer vulnerable to con artists. I could understand jokes. 
I was, at least I think I was no longer rigid. Maybe other people <laughs> feel differently. But I could weigh, you know, compare and contrast. And um, so profound change. And then I did the exercise for that kinesthetic part of, of me. And now I can actually play sports. I'm not uncoordinated. And imagine if I didn't know where the left side of my body was. When I drove a car, I didn't know where the left side of that car was. So my car was dented and dinged. Actually, it was my parents' car, um, uh, just like I was. Um, and now that doesn't happen. And then I went and worked on that spatial part. And I could do geometry after that. And I could read maps. And I could navigate. And I don't have to add in lost time. I always used to add lost time. I'd give myself an extra hour because I knew I would get lost multiple times anytime I went somewhere. And I don't have to do that. So you know, my life just opened up. And at that point, I thought, I want to take this work out into the world to help other individuals. And what I came to learn is that we all have our own unique cognitive profile of, of strengths and weaknesses. And when it becomes a learning challenge, learning difficulty, learning difference, is when there's what I call a cognitive load. So there, there are a pileup of different functions that are interfering with an individual's ability to engage with, um, with learning, with the learning process. And each function has a very, um, different flavor in a sense, like it has a different job to do. And I argue that you know, for this work to work, we have to go under the label to target the specific function. So we know certainly if a student has uh, is identified as having dyscalculia or uh, dyslexia, there can be multiple different cognitive functions that drive that diagnosis. And, and for the work that we do, we look at what are those functions for each individual and work on them. We just did uh, some research with a uh, retired uh, professor at the University of Toronto looking at uh, about 1,500 learning profiles of students that had gone through the assessment. And he, out of the 19, he just took the nine more common ones. And what he saw was 70% of the students had their own unique profile. 22% um, had a pattern shared with five or, or fewer individuals. And only 8% of the students had a pattern shared by six or more. So really going under the label, looking at the functions, and then what do we need to do? And what are some of these functions? Oh, sorry, I also mentioned if people are interested, we do have a questionnaire on our website uh, that you can go in and do. There are about 200 questions. Um, and based on the responses, it will um, give a report and say, this area might be there, or that area might be there. So it's, it's, yeah, the cognitive questionnaire. So you just find it on our website. Um, and then, so these cognitive functions, again, my, the work that we do at Aerosmith, we can currently identify and work on and strengthen 19 functions. And I'm really clear that's not everything that it can impact learning. It's just where our work is currently. So things like nonverbal ability, the ability to read nonverbal cues, um, numeracy, like the quantification sense, which is an aspect of, of mathematics, learning motor patterns that are critical for writing, um, memory functions that you know, are important for being able to hold information. We probably all know the person you send to the grocery store with five things to buy. They come back with three because they can't hold um, you know, what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and all of these are described in, in the book uh, that I wrote, but also on our website if people are interested in more information. And I'm always fascinated by this concept of cognitive mismatch. Um, we work with a lot of adults. And there's certain adults that we work with where their cognitive profile isn't quite aligned with the job that they're doing. So imagine you're a pilot, and you can't remember the instructions from the air traffic controller. So we worked with somebody like that. And his strategy, because we all develop compensations when we have these difficulties or workarounds, was to get the air traffic controller to repeat the instructions multiple times. But my worry was if he's flying into Chicago O'Hare or Atlanta, like the really busy airports, what if the air traffic controller can only say that once? Um, so I used to joke with him and say, you know, I just want to know if I'm getting on a plane, I want to know where you're flying so I'm not in the same airspace. The better alternative, which we did, is we addressed his difficulty and now he can hold the information that he hears. So I think sometimes these things that we call human error might be what I call a cognitive mismatch. I had a, um, a butcher that I worked with and he had that same kinesthetic problem. So, you know, he was holding a sharp knife in this hand and he didn't know where this hand was. 
was. So the first day I met him in my school, his left hand was all in bandages, right, because he was cutting himself. And we addressed that, and he doesn't do that anymore. I worked with a pathologist at, um, at Yale, actually. He was doing his residency there. And he had the what I call object recognition. So it's, it's the parallel region, you know, the symbol recognition is you hold the visual look of the word, like cat. Object recognition is um, in the other hemisphere, it's where you hold the look of the thing. So he was examining a slide with breast tissue. It was somebody that had had breast cancer. And she'd gone through uh, radiation and chemotherapy. And he knew how important it was to see, was she in remission? Um, and he looked really, really carefully, and he was just about to sign off that, yes, this person was in remission, when his supervisor came and said, didn't you see these cells here? This is cancer. And it wasn't that he didn't see them, because he looked at them, but he didn't register what they were. So he exited out of his residency program, addressed this function, and he won't make that mistake. So you know, these have, I've got all sorts of other examples. There are a lot that are in, in the book, but you know, if there's a, a, a difficulty in any function, it will have some kind of impact in the person's life. So if we want to look at uh, one of these functions, this is the symbol recognition. It, it's almost, uh, one researcher calls it the brain's letterbox. Uh, other researchers call it visual word form area. I call it symbol recognition. So this is you know, holding the visual look or the visual excuse me, image of a word. So the idea here, you can close your eyes. See, can you see the word cat up on a blackboard? Um, and again, these work on continuums. So some people will see really, you know, have that visual photographic memory. Um, where you can just look at something and then see it printed out in your mind's eye. Or some people will just see like a blank screen. Um, students that are struggling with reading are closer to that, that blank screen. They can't, can't call up visual imagery uh, of letter or symbol patterns. It'll also affect learning, um, you know, chemical equations, anything that's the visual template uh, in terms of, of learning. So what do we do if somebody has this difficulty? Um, for years, I actually thought this was Amharic on the screen here, this language. And in Seattle the other night, I was told it's Armenian. So I'm now going to think that this person did know what she was saying. So if anybody's in the audience, now this is, I've been told, Armenian. So we have multiple different languages, I think 44 different languages built into a computer program. Um, and students often will say, well, I'm struggling with English. Why are we using Telugu, Sinhalese, Burmese, Urdu? or Armenian, um, and the idea is we don't want the student to be able to compensate. We don't want them to be able to use sound. We don't want them to be able to use meaning. We're trying to target as much as possible into that function to work it. Just sort of like, you know, if you're doing physiotherapy for one muscle, you're trying to target that, that muscle or that muscle group. So the student has to look at all these unusual symbols. And we have from very simple languages to very complex languages. We start with one symbol. We go up to eight symbols. By the end of this program, a student is holding eight Chinese characters in their mind's eye. Um, and what it does is we're not teaching content. We're not teaching skill. Um, we're not working around. We're targeting in to build a strength in that area where there was a, a difficulty. And at the end of this program, we see improvements in spelling, word recognition, reading speed um, as a result of, of working on this. So again, this is what I call a capacity-based program. I believe what we're doing is changing the cognitive capacity of the brain to be able to handle and do the, the job that that area was designed to do. And then we work with a number of individuals that have nonverbal difficulties. So there's a researcher that calls this area cognitive Goldilocks, which I really like. Because this is the area that allows you to put yourself into a situation before you get into that situation and think about, OK, what effect do I want to have in this situation? What do I want to accomplish? What outcome do I want to have? And you create a plan. And then you put yourself into the situation. And as you're executing your plan, you start to read the nonverbal cues. And then modify your, your behavior based on the response that you're getting to see are you actually you know, um, accomplishing what you want to accomplish in that situation. So a good negotiator has to be strong in this area. So I showed this picture uh, to a 12-year-old girl in Toronto. And she was in the program. And she was identified in her neighborhood as a liar. Like That's what all the children said. She lies all the time. And nobody wanted to play with her. And so when I showed her uh, that picture, I asked her, what, what, you know, what do you think is happening in the picture? And it's sort of hard to see. Well, she looked at it, and she said they're playing badminton. 
And so I asked her, could she tell me why she thought that? And uh, this woman here, I don't know if you can see it, she's got netting on the front of her hat, like the woman that's holding out her arms. And this is what I call premature closure, which is very typical if there's a difficulty here. This girl looked at one element of the picture. It triggered an association with a badminton net, because it's a net. And she didn't actively survey the rest of what was going on in, in the picture. And that was her interpretation. So certainly, she wasn't lying. This is how she saw her world. She's now in her 30s. We address this problem. Um, she doesn't make those kind of mistakes. But this is the person that, you know, if there's difficulty here, um, that's socially awkward. They misread. Uh, you know, those social cues. They may think, you know, something is going on that's not really happening. Um, you know, poor at all that social navigation, planning, or if they're strong here, this is the person that is, you know, can read very uh, um, subtle social cues. Does it affect the individual academically? I mean, I would say it more affects them socially, but it will affect them from being able to read nonverbal cues from a teacher in terms of expectation. So it is a really important area. And we know that um, the students in the adolescent class are successful as they're working through this area because they start dating um, and because they can navigate that. But it's, it's kind of a two-edged sword because now they want to date and they don't want to do their homework. Um, but they eventually recognize that it was doing the work that allowed them to do that. So they get back into the groove. But this is also the person that leaps before they look. Um, so we probably all know people that you know have a little bit of this. And again, they're on continuum. So someone could be just have a mild problem you know, moderate problem or severe problem here. Or somebody can be gifted in this area. So what are some of the outcomes as we work on this function? Um, not only that the person can now read nonverbal cues, but they can plan um, uh, activities socially. And they can start to interpret and regulate their own emotional responses and modulate their, their emotions. So what, if we think about um, you know, various approaches, uh, you know, to address learning difficulties. And all of these have benefit. And certainly all of these were things that helped me get through school. So there's compensatory, which we all know is using tools or technology to support um, the, the learner. So voice recognition software, Kurzweil readers, um, you know, using a digital recorder to record notes if you can't uh, remember or you can't write. Then there's what I call content skill-based approaches, which you know the best of them will do a task analysis. They'll look at the profile of the learner, say this person is really strong with phonemic awareness. So if we're going to teach reading, we'll use a, a program that will um, load on that. Or if they're really good more with visual recognition, sight word memory, we'll use a program that will load on that. And then there's strategies, which are always important, like metacognition, you know, strategies to approach learning. And here, in each of these, um, the premise is you know, the learner is a fixed system. And we're modifying the external or the delivery of the content to meet the profile of the learner. And then there are what I call capacity-based programs, where we're saying, actually, the capacity of the learner can be modified and changed. And this comes out of the, the sort of neuroplastic premise. And all of them, I mean, we need to learn content, we need to learn skills, we need to learn strategies. And the capacity is what fundamentally underlines the, the student's ability to do that efficiently and effectively. So our premise of the, the work that we do is that we can actually change the capacity of the learner to learn. And so what might it look like if we combine cognitive programs uh, that enhance and strengthen capacity with academic programs? So we've, we've done a number of studies of, with about 700 plus students. There are 20 studies. 11 of them are peer reviewed. Two of them have been published across 19 schools in four countries. And researchers with different researchers, different research designs. Um, and what we're finding across the, the studies are academic changes, cognitive changes. And now I'll show you in a few minutes some of the imaging, the brain changes that we're seeing in students going through the program. So this was a study done in the Toronto Catholic District School Board. Um, and it's really important to note these students, um, when they're in the green bar here, we're getting 50% less academics. So in the gray, these students were students identified. There's 60 students in the Toronto Catholic District School Board, which is a publicly funded board, uh, as having learning difficulties. And they were getting special education support. So all day, they were in academic classes and getting you know, traditional special education support. And they were learning at about 2 thirds of a year per year, which is not 
atypical for students with learning difficulties. They tend to start falling behind their peers because of their difficulties. We took them out of academics 50% of their day and we put them into cognitive programs. So over a 10 month academic period, these students were getting a half day cognitive, half day academic. And what the, the study found was at the end of the year, they doubled and tripled their rate of learning in, in academic areas. And to me, it's you change the capacity to learn, the learning goes, goes forward. So this was in, in Canada. This study was done in Melbourne, Australia. Um, uh, over one year, and again, these students in the Aerosmith, which are the green, are getting 50% less academics than the students in the gray. And uh, in Victoria, where the state that Melbourne's in, they pre and post test the students at the beginning of the year, the end of the year, and they, they look at average academic improvement, um, both in reading comprehension and mathematics, uh, over the course of the year. And what you can see, the gray is the students without learning difficulties getting 100% academics. The green are the students 50% of the day academics. And their average gain on these academic skills over the course of the year. And in all cases, the group getting the cognitive program outperformed the group getting more curriculum. Again, the idea you change the capacity to learn, you change the brain's capacity to learn, learning goes forward um, for these individuals. And then this was a study done at the University of British Columbia, uh, UBC, using the Woodcock-Johnson. Uh, again, these students were only getting two academic periods a day, so even less academics, because um, uh, they were only getting math and English. And the rest of the other six periods in the day, they were doing cognitive programming. And everything that's in yellow is statistically significant on the Woodcock-Johnson. This was across three schools. Actually, the school in Redmond was one of these schools, um, and two schools in, in Vancouver area. And seeing, again, you change the capacity, significant academic gains. And then these are two more studies. And all this, these studies are, this document is on our website if people are interested. Um, I have a couple here as well, which summarizes all the, the more current research. And if you're looking on the website, if you click into the title of each study, it'll take you actually right into the study. Um, and so this was University of Calgary in the Brain Gain Lab and Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois. Again, showing exactly the same things. These students, in both of these studies, we're only getting two academic periods a day, and the rest were cognitive um, programs. And so all of these things that are listed here, word reading, reading fluency, comprehension, spelling, computation, uh, quantitative mathematical concepts, math fluency, all of these change significantly over the course of a 10-month academic period. Um, and what the University of Calgary researchers, their conclusion was strengthening cognitive or neuropsychological functions presumed to underlie underlie academic achievement deficits, improves reading, mathematics, and writing by targeting the cause, the cognitive deficit, rather than the symptoms or the achievement deficit. So again, I just argue you change the cognitive capacity, you change academic outcomes. Then they're also looking in the, these studies that, um, this is Southern Illinois University at UBC in Calgary, on, on the Woodcock-Johnson over the course of a 10-month school year, changes on cognitive measures. So everything that's in yellow here, processing speed, uh, number facility, perceptual speed, cognitive efficiency, all of these are significantly, excuse me, changing as the students go through um, this program. And it's all, all on the website. And so here's the list. So this is now, that was Southern Illinois University, University of Calgary, UBC. And the UBC study was just, um, published in a journal in October, and it's on our website if people are interested. So all these cognitive abilities, so we're seeing the academic abilities, the cognitive abilities, and then UBC uh, looked at students in Aerosmith, these are the red here, and compared them to um, students that were in the school board getting traditional special education. So again, these are all students with learning difficulties. And they looked at, again, on the Woodcock-Johnson, they averaged the cognitive scores and the academic scores. And again, these students are only getting two academic periods a day, and the rest is all cognitive. And what you see is significant improvement um, in cognition and also in achievement, because it's the brain that drives the learning. And then we're looking at uh, social, emotional, and behavioral improvement. Again, this is at UBC on the behavior assessment system for children. And the measures at the top 
are what they call adaptive measures. So these are things like leadership, social skills, adaptability. The ADL is uh, activities of daily living, so being organized. Uh, all of those had improved over the course uh, of the year. The bottom half of the, the data here are what they call maladaptive behaviors. So this is um, challenges with attention, withdrawal, anxiety, somatization, which is like, you know, I feel sick, I don't want to go to school, depression, anxiety, um, all of those reduced over the course of the year. Um, so, uh, so not only does it affect academics and cognitive, but social emotional behavior. And then this uh, data is coming out of uh, Dr. Shona Reichel's lab in, at UBC. And she found a greater sense of uh, well-being and happiness in students from November to May that were in Aerosmith. And she was quite surprised when she looked at this data because she said that's not typical. The typical pattern is students from November to May start to feel more stress. They feel less happy, um, less of a sense of well-being because they're going into exams and they're starting to feel anxious. Whereas the Aerosmith students were absolutely the reverse. And I argue it's because now they have the cognitive wherewithal to handle that material that they didn't have before. So they're feeling better about themselves. Um, they used one of Carol Dweck's measures. People probably know her work, this incremental theory of mind, you really can't be in an Aerosmith classroom and think your mind is fixed because you're actually changing your, your cognitive capacity. So that really wasn't a surprise. Um, locus of control, viewing yourself as an agent of change. And what was really fascinating, they started to see a reduction in cortisol. So a physiological measure um, in terms of stress. So all of these things uh, are, are changing in these individuals. Then what we've also now done research uh, of students without learning difficulties. So just putting this program into a regular academic class. This was a study done in Australia. Uh, and there were four grade one classes in the school. This is a publicly funded school. And they took the motor planning exercise, which is an appropriate exercise for grade one, and 30 minutes a day, one of the classes, five days a week, did the motor planning exercise. And it works in motor plans for writing and also motor plans for eye tracking and reading. And they pre and post tested them on a standardized uh, test of uh, writing speed and accuracy, the Wold sentence copy test. And they found that the group doing 30 minutes a day uh, over the, that um, 10 month academic period outperformed. You can see the percent change, 85% compared to 40%, 10%, and 40% in the other group. So that small amount of work had a significant change. And they decided at the beginning of the study, there were five students identified in kindergarten that they were going to be at risk for reading difficulties. And so they were already identified. They put all five into this class doing the 30 minutes a day of the motor planning. And 10 weeks in, they were all de-identified because that early intervention with the motor planning and the eye tracking made that, that difference. Um, then this was a study done in Madrid, in Spain. And these students don't speak any English, but we had to train the teachers in English. And this exercise is the clocks, the first exercise I created for myself, symbol relations, I call it, or reasoning. Uh, and again, 30 minutes a day, these grade three students were doing this exercise five days a week. And after three months, uh, the university in Madrid was studying these students. They had changed in their visual spatial ability, the reasoning, attention, executive functioning, planning. And um, this study has just been accepted uh, to be presented at a conference in Prague this summer. So again, this benefits individuals with learning difficulties, but also uh, anybody, an, any student, right? I mean, you can strengthen cognitive functioning. And this was a summary statement. Uh, there was a conference in, in New York in February. Um, and one of the researchers, uh, basically this was her conclusion, saying the research findings at UBC and SIU are consistent. There seems to be a story here about cognitive efficiency, which includes working memory and attention and learning, the capacity to learn new things. These are really important cognitive skills for success at school and life in general. And it's really important to consider that we saw this much improvement after only one year of what's typically a much longer program for a lot of students. We're excited to see what may unfold if we look at students with their full treatment uh, regimen and we're continuing this this research. So then what are we seeing in the brains of these individuals? So there are two labs looking at this. This is uh, Lara Boyd at UBC in the Brain Beha Behavior Lab and Greg Rose who's a neuroscientist at Southern Illinois University. And 
these are the images of the brains of students without learning difficulties, you know, sort of the uh, within network connectivity, the between network connectivity, uh, and this research was presented uh, in March of 2019, actually to a conference here in San Francisco, the Cognitive Neuroscience Society conference. So this is kind of what it looks like in a brain that's not struggling with learning, and this is what it looks like in a, a brain that's struggling with learning. These are individuals identified as learning difficulties. And what the research is showing, there's a pattern of underconnectivity in the brain, um, so there are areas that aren't functioning like they weren't functioning in me, uh, the way they're designed. And then the response to other areas in the brain is to become hyper-connected. So to start working really, really hard to try to do the job of the underconnected areas. But the thing is they, they can't really do those jobs. So it's a really, really a brain working really, really hard but not really efficiently or effectively. And it, that won't really come as a surprise, you know, anybody that has a learning difficulty or lives with somebody with a learning difficulty, you see these students working so much harder than other students, and that was my experience, but not getting the same results as the students that aren't working as hard. So what's going on in the brain is sort of parallel, parallel in their experience in learning. And so what are we seeing over time? This is the students in the six-week cognitive intensive program. So a few years ago, I took the number of hours we do in our 10-month um, part-time program, and I compressed it into six weeks. That's why it's intense. Um, so it's five hours a day, five days a week, six weeks in the summer. We have people flying in from all around the world to do this program. Um, and so what we're seeing in this uh, six-week program is the underconnected areas are starting to connect, and the hyperconnected areas are starting to relax. And this was presented at the uh, Society for Neuroscience conference in October in Chicago. And we're seeing changes in the default mode network, the salience network, and the executive control network, which is really critical for attention, for planning, self-regulation, for theory of mind, being able to put ourselves into somebody else's situation, take perspective of another person, self-awareness, cognitive control. Um, so all, all of this is shifting as these students go through this program. And if we think about the salience network, this is the network that in these students was showing as quite underconnected. And it's critical for, it kind of asks the question, what's relevant? What's important? What's critical in a situation? What should I pay attention to? And um, over the six weeks, what we saw was a significant strengthening of the connections within that network. And a mother of a student, in Texas, that's in a school that has this, the program, said six months into the program, my son literally woke up. Similar to stories of patients in a coma waking up. One day he walked into a classroom and anxiously asked, where have I been? Why haven't I noticed all these things before? And what I think w woke up in this individual was his salience network. And in fact, he just graduated from high school and his mother sent us his, his speech. And he, he's now, um, engaged, aware, comprehending, uh, and going off to, to college. So what the research is showing us in the brain is this work is fundamentally changing um, the network connectivity. And what are we seeing after 10 months? <coughs> The same pattern of students going through the program, the reduction of the hyperconnected areas, and increase in underconnectivity. So we're seeing it in the six weeks and into the end of one year, and we're continuing to image the brains of students uh, in the program in Toronto over the course of this year. We work um, use the imaging at Sick Children's Hospital. And then this was coming out of the Dr. Lara Boyd's lab, showing in a different view of the brain. This is fMRI, um, but we're seeing the same pattern. So this is the, the brain here, over here at the baseline, the brain of the students before intervention, before they're engaging in the program. And then we had to adapt the reasoning exercise for the scanner because you can't really move much. Uh, and three months in and 10 months into the program, what you see, you see behind me, um, is that to do the reasoning activity before they were engaged in the program was taking a lot of real estate in the brain. So the brain was having to work, again, really hard. This is just another way of showing that. And three months in and one year in, what they saw was much more efficient processing, not needing to call on as many areas. And the areas that were designed to do that uh, were functioning. And what Dr. Boyd 
how she explains it. She says, we don't always want to have to be doing maximal effort in our brains. It's just like our muscles. If your brain is fit and accomplished at a task, you should be able to dial it down, and that frees your cognitive resources to do other things. And then this is coming out of the UBC lab as well. Um, this is the default mode network, and the prefrontal cortex is active in the default mode network. And you can see, I don't know if this is that like a pointer. You, no, it doesn't show. So you can see here, this is the prefrontal cortex up here. Uh, tiny little red dot, and then three months into the program, much more activation in the prefrontal cortex. And we saw that also in the 10 months. And the prefrontal cortex is really, really important. This is what is kind of your strategy generator. It's like executive function, problem solving, planning, organizing. Um, you know, using your past experiences to plan for future events, uh, thinking um, is, is, resides here. And what we're seeing is significant change in this functioning, which we also see if you, you know, investigate with the students as they're moving through this program. And I remember a student that we worked with who had gone through university uh, and his parents, kind of described him as lazy. Um, he was just drifting, not really doing much, um, you know, kind of staying up all night, sleeping all day. And I said, I don't think he's really lazy. I actually think he has this, this difficulty. And he came in for a year in the program in um, Toronto. And uh, I remember from somebody that was lazy partway through, I mean, he just, he said, I just can't stop myself. Like, I just see things everywhere. I, I start to do things, um, even cleaning his room. Um, and he was gifted spatially before we did anything with him and in terms of mechanical abilities. So after he finished the year, he decided to go back to school. He did a four-year design program. He designed an ambulance, like just brilliant. Uh, Michelin has a contest. He came second in the world designing a racing car. Um, and he won, I don't know how many awards on graduation. And all the companies wanted him. And he's just now, I think he's now running the company. Um, but we didn't give him those incredible gifts and abilities. We gave him the engine to drive those abilities. Um, and that's you know, some of the power of, of this work. If you have gifts in a certain area but have difficulties in another area, it's sometimes you can't use those gifts very effectively because you're spending so much time and energy trying to support the difficulties or you have a difficulty that means you're kind of disengaged or disorganized and can't utilize those, those gifts. And we've got lots of um, examples of, of individuals with this difficulty. How much time do I have left? Five more minutes, okay. Um, I was thinking that uh, one other example with a difficulty here, I had this a student, she was 19, that had this um, problem. And she was making really poor judgment calls because she couldn't kind of think into the future to realize some of her behavior was going to lead her into difficulties. And as she worked on this, she started to be able to do that consequential thinking and realize, actually, I shouldn't be engaging in this behavior. And her parents were really, really happy because they had to rescue her lots of times. But she walked into the school one day looking really depressed. And I thought, like, you should be happy, but she wasn't. She said, I have a stop sign in my brain now. She said, I, I go to do something, and the stop sign comes and says, don't do it. I mean, eventually, she made peace with that stop sign. But it was, it was an adjustment because it wasn't what she was, um, was used to. So really, really important area. And Greg Rose, in that same presentation in New York last February, said, what have we learned? He said, we know that Aerosmith training strengthens network connectivity, but such training also re reduces hyperconnectivity. These students start in their brains relatively poorly and end relatively well. The whole system is moving in a positive direction, the right direction, just in varying degrees uh, right now. There is neuroplasticity as a function of Aerosmith training, which improves performance. Nothing changes in your brain. Nothing changes in your performance. Big change in the brain, big change in performance. And of course, this is not the final answer on this, but I think it's uh, uh, very suggestive that changes in the brain are, in fact, driving changes in performance. So do precise Aerosmith cognitive exercises activate and functionally change particular areas or networks of the brain? The answer is yes. And when I read Rosenzweig's challenge in 1977, he basically laid down a gauntlet. He said, can we take this work that's being done in rats and apply it to humans? And I think the answer is yes, um, that, that that is what this work has, has shown. And I started it because of my own um, 
need and then took it out into the world. And we're currently working in, I think, 90 schools in 10 countries. And, and our goal is to make this work accessible. And if we think about what it is, it's this targeted cognitive programs, which is you know, targeted differential stimulation to different functions, driving effort for processing, which drives neuroplastic change, which is leading to changes in the brain, which leads to increased cognitive capacity, which changes the ability to learn, which leads to increased social emotional well being and increased academic success and I would say increased vocational um, success. So what do I dream of? I dream of a day when cognitive transformation is just a normal part of curriculum. We go to school to learn. We learn with our brain. It just seems to me that it should be a good marriage between neuroscience and education, that, that there are good cognitive programs. If people are interested, I have a whole plan. Grade one, we do the motor planning. Grade two, we do visual memory. Grade three, we do um, the numeracy piece. Grade four, the reasoning. Grade five, executive functioning. Grade six, nonverbal. Um, and 30 minutes a day, five days a week, you know. And, and then every school would also have a cognitive classroom where students that are having, uh, you know, some more challenges could spend a couple more periods. So, and then by the end of elementary school, it would be just a different possibility for these individuals. I work with a lot of adults who say to me, I didn't choose my career. They said, I got to a certain point and there were so many doors closed, there was only one or two doors that I could walk through. And I think what this work does is it opens multiple doors. And maybe they'll make the same choice and decide I'm gonna walk through that door, but now it's a choice, not a forced choice. And so that is, is my vision. And this concept of dare to dream, again, a lot of students myself included, at a certain point shut down their dreams because they didn't really see a really great future for themselves. And I think through unlocking these you know, cognitive challenges and transforming them into strengths, not only do we allow these individuals to dream, but they now have the cognitive wherewithal to actually live their dreams. So I thank you for listening to me tonight. And then I'm going to, I think there's the next. All right, so I'm, I'm going to invite Jill Malott up to talk a little bit as a parent who's had her daughter in the program, and this is Carly here um, with that funny little thing on her nose. <laughs> but if you want to come up and, and share your story, I really, sure. really appreciate that. Hi. Um, that's tough to follow. <laughs> um, so I don't have an advanced degree in education or neuroscience, but... Um, what I do have is the last 13 years of experience of trying to support my kids. So. Can you hear me better? Okay, so I've, I've spent the last 13 years trying to figure out how to support our daughter. And her name's Carly. Um, during those 13 years, Carly has been at five different schools, two of which were at Charles Armstrong. She has worked with a countless number of tutors. And we've also seen a whole host of therapists just trying to figure out how to help her understand how she learns and to feel good about how she learns and to learn how to advocate for accommodations that she needed to learn. So um, those 13 years were largely spent on the things Barbara talked about. They were compensatory and they were trying to arm her with the advocacy skills to get those compensatory tools that she needed and also to be able to fight for what she needed on the accommodation front. But she was still super frustrated and um, she would constantly say, even though I'm doing all this stuff, I feel like something is blocking my ability to be and to achieve what I know I'm capable of. So um, about a year and a half ago, Joe Bowler had reached out to me and said, I know of this program and I would like to take Carly with me to Toronto to look at it a little bit further. And to be honest, I was a little bit skeptical because I had felt like, haven't we turned over every rock? Like, aren't we doing everything we can for this girl? And, um, but Carly, of course, caught wind of it. And Carly heard this term, you know, maybe you can change your brain. And when she heard that, and it wasn't about 
we're going to put in accommodations all around you and further support you to accommodate your brain, but we can change your brain, she was all in. And so um, change her brain, it did. I, I wish she could be here tonight to talk to you about the way it's changed her brain. She's actually off on a school trip, so she can't be here. But I wanted to share with you just this brief video she made about the changes she's seen in herself and as her, her parent, the changes I've seen in her. And I fundamentally think it has changed her trajectory, not only at school, but fundamentally in life. So this is Carly. Hi, my name is Carly, I'm a junior. And in my sophomore year, I did the Aerosmith program. It really transformed my brain. Before, I was diagnosed with dyslexia the summer before fourth grade. But it was all about coping with dyslexia, learning strategies to make stuff easier. But Aerosmith was about targeting my dyslexia, my weak working memory, and my slow processing speeds. Well, a way that I feel differently now that I've done Aerosmith is that I'm able to keep up with conversation and points that people are making. Before, I was lost within the discussion. I wasn't able to keep up, not even fire back points. I was kind of just sitting quietly, internally, trying to figure out everything that was going on. For example, last year in history, we had a seminar, and I was Russia in the debate. And I was trying, it was the Congress of Vienna. I was trying to negotiate for land. However, I did really badly because I couldn't keep up. But in history this year, I had 21 of my peers yelling at me, trying to get me impeached. And as my teacher said, I was able to fire back as quickly as I was able to take it. <laughs> Another example of how I feel different is my way that I can solve multi-step problems. Before, I would get lost within the numbers and I was really confused. I could only section out one thing at a time. So in Algebra 1, which is clearly more simple than the other maths I've taken, um, I, would, I wasn't doing so well because I just could not see how all the steps fit together to make the answer that I received. But in Algebra 2, which is much more complex, I'm now able to see how everything is related and be able to apply different concepts within a problem. Aerosmith has really helped me feel more self-confident and clear this fog that was over my head. I kept on feeling, I knew that I could do stuff in my brain. I mean, I knew that I was more capable than the results I was having. And so it was so frustrating for people to think I was stupid or just unintelligent. But I was able to, Aerosmith allowed me to clear this fog from my brain and really access everything that I have. Before, I was positive about my dyslexia. I'm, I was always um, sharing my story. But after Aerosmith, it's completely different. It's truly amazing how I'm able to learn now. Well, I definitely feel more self-confident and happy. Before Aerosmith, I would have never been able to give a presentation like this. I mean, talking continuously with my weak working memory and slow processing speed, like that was a done deal. I couldn't do that. But now I'm able to speak in these coherent sentences and make sense to people who are listening to me, which I wasn't able to do before. And so it gives me the self-confidence of doing that presentation, going up to the board to solve that math problem, contributing in class. Like, I have this newfound self-confidence, which makes me generally just very happy. I really just want to thank Barbara Aerosmith for creating this program and allowing me to unlock my brain completely to experience all these things I thought I was never going to be able to. Um, it's really transformed my brain and my entire life, so I'm incredibly thankful for the experience. Anyone who feels like they have this fog over their brain or they're not realizing their true potential, I really encourage you to check out this program because it's completely transformed my life and I hope it can do the same for you. So, happy to take some questions now. I think we have to end sharp at 8, is that? Um, just around 8, and then okay. we can And then do some book time. signing, yes. So, um, and maybe Debbie Gilmore is here, the executive uh, director um, of Aerosmith. So, yeah, I guess if we want to field some questions. Okay.
if you had your hand up first. Oh, there's a microphone here, so maybe. Okay, you wanna, I can yes. do that. So how do we sign up? Like, <laughs> <laughs> do we have to go to Canada? I, I would love to find a way to bring the work here, and often it's parents that advocate for the program. I mean, a number of years ago, a number of mothers in Atlanta, they made little name tags, Mums for Aerosmith, and they just knocked on all sorts of doors of schools, and not every door opened, but there were four schools in Atlanta that took on the program. So I would say probably, I think, 80% of the schools is through parent advocacy. So. No, we have learning centers as well um, that, that offer the program, so, so there, there's a, the range of options. And um, if you're interested, you could get Debbie's card afterwards. We have people in uh, Toronto that are happy to do webinars, to explain this to educators, and we're happy to you know, come back here. I would really love it to be um, really accessible you know, everywhere in the world for children that struggle um, with learning. Yes. And so uh, I just want to introduce myself. Oh, I'm Beth Powell, and yes. I'm actually one of the Open Doors desperately seeking to bring this to the Bay Area. Um, we attempted it uh, about a year ago, and we loved the program. Parents were thrilled, but we hit the logistical issue in the Bay Area of space and funding for teachers. Um, and so if people are interested and we have the interest up mm -hmm. front and we can talk to people about space ideas, I would really love to have an open conversation with anyone that's interested. I have business cards. Um, I'll stand up real quick just because <laughs> I'm very serious. I want this in the Bay Area. <laughs> um, I've referred people to Canada and actually had people go to Toronto and yeah. their lives were truly changed. Yeah. It's incredible. And I don't know, Christine, do you want to say something? Or Christine's had her daughter in the program. Oh, Debbie, just one moment. So Christine over here. Yeah, just, yeah, I just, and then, yeah. I need the microphone. It's just, sorry, we will come back over there. I'm Christine Giordano, and my daughter, Mia, is um, proof positive of the Aerosmith method. When she was eight years old, um, she was asked to leave a very prominent private school here in Menlo Park, and I was told that, um, I would have to accept the fact that she had a disability, straight up. Bottom line, fast forward, um, the brain can change. I was always a believer in neuroplasticity and I would not accept that diagnosis. And fortunately, we had an opportunity to meet um, Howard Eaton, who had the Eaton Aerosmith School in Vancouver. And so we were gonna move to Vancouver and then <laughs> we found a way to bring Aerosmith here. So my daughter and Mia went through the full program here in the Bay Area, and we benchmarked her scientifically all the way through. And from where she was when she started the program to where she is now, she is in mainstream, and we chose uh, Design Tech High School because we're a believer of charter schools and school choice, and had it not been for school choice, we never would have been able to design a program specifically for her. And she now has a GPA of 4.3 with no accommodations, other than she does get some extra time. Um, and going through the program, I can tell you that it is brain changing. We can see the developmental changes as she went along uh, year after year with the exercises. And they're benchmarked within the program because mm -hmm. you have these uh, learning, learning um, assessments. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing that I think I could tell you in this short window of time, because I want to give other people a chance to ask questions, is that conventional wisdom is, in, especially in the United States, is that you go through programs, um, not programs, excuse me, you go through school, and the schools are designed to teach you certain content as you go through each grade level, right? And then you have to look at it and make a paradigm shift. If the, if the cognitive capacity is not able to take in the information, then what's the point of jamming it in? That's where you get children who are depressed, sad, doubtful, um, uh, feel like they're stupid, they measure themselves against their peers. So we as parents, what, I guess what I could give you a, from my experience is that in, there is no gap, okay? Children can learn as their capacities 
um, are able to expand. Aerosmith does that. They open up the pathways through diligent effort of the student. And the most important thing is that the student is in charge of its own learning. So the student then is empowered. The student recognizes that they are smart. They have capabilities. And they are able to master subject matter. Uh, she took physics. Um, Mia took physics freshman year in high school. Got an A. She's mm -hmm. taking um, calculus right now as a junior and getting an A. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, there are so many things that I could tell you. But with a short window of time, it would be a miracle to bring it here to, um, to the Bay Area because we have such a high, <coughs> high rate of dyslexia. And this program, through other students, because we have friends that also master the program, went through the program and very successful now. And uh, it's really important work that Barbara did. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart, because Mia is proof positive mm -hmm. of, of the miraculous work that, that you all do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Inger Dewey Globe, and I read about you years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm so honored to meet you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. How, how long do you have to do the program? A little bit confused, because at one point you said 30 minutes a day, five days a week for five weeks. But is it five hours a day? I mean, is it, it different per person? You make an assessment on what their baseline we, is? We, and then we, what? Yeah, we assess the, the, the students and create their profile. The rule of thumb is about you know four hours per week per function over a 10-month span. Then we took those four hours over 10 months and we compressed them into our cognitive intensive. So that is a six-week program and it's intense because they're doing five hours a day, uh, five days a week over six weeks. So they're getting the same amount of time in that compressed, um, you know, on that one cognitive function. And then we have schools that are doing it with students without learning difficulties where they're doing 30 minutes a day, five days a week. We're seeing the results starting at three months, but they're continuing over the course of the 10-month academic period. And it's pretty, pretty typical that around the two to three month mark, any student that's engaged in the program starts to feel cognitive change. It doesn't mean it's complete, but it's about that, that marker point where they notice they can start to do things that they couldn't do before. Um, you know, things are starting to get easier. Parents, grandparents, people around them start to notice those, um, those kind of changes. But it, it's, it's typically four hours a week per function over you know, an academic year that we're working. And then some of the schools, if students have multiple difficulties, are working on multiple functions. So they're, as with some of this research, they were working six periods a day, so working on six different cognitive functions over the course of a year. Um, but it's all individualized because we, we do an assessment at the beginning um, to look at that cognitive profile. And then um, a number of years ago, I decided, you know, what if I get hit by a bus? You know, maybe I should be, you know, putting my knowledge somewhere. So we, we, I mean, as software developers, create an expert system. So now, you know, when the the assessment is done and the learning profile is there, my knowledge is built into the system that looks at all that data and then creates the kind of like a triage. So if there are these seven areas. Um, there for that individual, what is the first thing that should be worked on and what level do we need to start? And then we, we track, like we, I love data, so you know, we talk about big data. We, we track down to keystrokes of students in the program all around the world. We've built in um, benchmark analysis, so, and we work very closely with the teachers all around the world. Um, so we're tracking all of the, the, the progress of students, and we're, if we see a student um, not meeting the expectations by a certain percentage or exceeding them by a certain percentage, then we start a conversation to see, you know, maybe their compensations if they're going too quickly or, um, or if they're not going quickly enough, what's going on, right? So it, it's, you know, when I decided to put this work out into the world out of my school, I thought I spoke to people that actually developed reading programs. So Carl Breider that was part of DISTAR. And what I kept hearing is they felt they had a good program, they would you know, train educators, but they didn't provide support. So the educator would get the program into the, the school. Something didn't work. They started to modify it. So it really, in the end, wasn't the program. So nobody was happy uh, at the end. So I 
felt I have to build a huge support system for the educators that are doing the program so that the student gets the best delivery of the program. And that's our, that's our model. We do ongoing professional development with the teachers around the world. Um, my commitment, I have a little picture of Isabel beside my computer, who was like four and a half when she came into the program, uh, who's now a medical doctor in, in Toronto. And it's always pushing boundaries and supporting the student. Because when she came in, I didn't know if I could work with students that young. Um, and I had to modify all sorts of exercises to um, access her. In fact, a few weeks ago in Toronto, I met another um, parent whose son was about four when he came through the door. And she looked at some of the exercises and said, he said she said, he will eat those. He won't do them. He'll actually eat them. <laughs> um, so uh, he's now just graduated from engineering. So it, it's. You know, my commitment is to every student that's engaged in this program to ensure they get the best possible delivery. So, and we do that through s tracking and supporting teachers. I, I was just wondering if you have any research or study um, involving s um, children or adults with um, intellectual disability. Um, currently, we don't have a specific study. We have worked with a number of individuals um, that come in. It's a, it's a small percentage that have that, that diagnosis. And we look at everyone case by case. So we would look at the reports that have been done. Um, I can't say with the same amount of confidence in terms of the trajectory of somebody with that diagnosis compared to somebody with a learning difficulty. There's some suggestion in the research there might be less neuroplasticity. However, in the cases that we worked with, if the parents are you know, willing to kind of go on that journey, you know, we'll do it on a year-by-year -year basis and track and see if we're getting um, progress. And w in the number of cases, we've got very significant progress. So, but we would have to just, we'd have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. Hi, over here. Um, notwithstanding that we're at CHC, I was wondering what type of programming you had for adults. Um, we have lots of the, the same kind of programming that we have for, for students. So we would do the assessment um, and then identify what are the cognitive functions that need to be addressed. And we have part-time programs. So, um, you know, so a number of centers that offer the program also offer like, uh, you know, after hours. We also now have uh, there are two programs that were have trialed now for a couple of years, and it's one that Carly did that we're doing remotely. So Carly did the work here, but she worked with a facilitator in Toronto. Um, the, so the idea was the facilitator would train her on the exercise, then Carly basically had to do the work. And then as, this, as Carly mastered something, the facilitator would Skype in and train her on the next level. Um, so they're, they're, you know, we're committed to trying to make this program more accessible to the whole range. The oldest person I've worked with was 81. Yeah, yeah. I think you're a little younger than that. <laughs> yeah. I think you partly answered my question because my son is 16. He's a junior in high school, and as you're describing your, these kids, that's my kid. And I'm like, okay, but we don't live in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Nothing exists yet here, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. And so are there, um, is it only teachers that are trained? But um, you're talking about you can actually no, that, do that, it through Skyping. Yeah, that, what can parents do? Is there some, I don't know, I guess. Yeah, just so it would be probably getting Debbie's card, and then we can let you know what, what's available remotely. Like we have two programs, the motor planning one, uh, and the reasoning, uh, one that we're now delivering from Toronto all around the world. Um, and we have the, the six-week cognitive intensive program, and we're just offering it in the French Alps this summer, if anybody wants to go to the French Alps. <laughs> there, I, I, I want to go. <laughs> well, there are, if you want some exotic locations for oh, the intensive Thailand. program, yeah. we have Thailand, there is the, going to be the French Alps, then there is Toronto, and then there is Seattle and Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, they're the sites that are offering our intensive program right now. <laughs> but no, we've had we've had a whole family have come from Australia and mum, dad, and the two children. Yeah. Okay, I'll come back with my card. Any questions here? Thank you. Um, you talk about the intensive program being the same amount of hours as the one done over ten months mm -hmm. in small increments. Have you measured the difference in um, a student getting them 
in the intensive versus is it the same amount of growth? It seems to actually be more. Really, um, in faster the because it's so intense. Okay. Um, yes, I mean one of uh, the st one of the studies that was presented at the Society for Neuroscience was on um, that, and we're seeing the same kind of cognitive changes, the academic changes in that six weeks, uh, and we're seeing the, the, these changes happening in the brain, and we um, are running it so we image the students that come into the program in Toronto, obviously with their permission, and they have to be within a certain age range. Um, so we'll be doing, we've, we've done that now, two summers in a row, we're continuing it, and we're imaging students that are in the 10 month program. So we're building up, well, I mean, one of my um, goals, we're creating a global research, research initiative. So we have the researchers in Madrid, uh, the University of Tallinn in Estonia, um, Southern Illinois University, UBC, and we're talking to researchers. We're in Melbourne in a week in Australia, and we're talking to researchers at the Brain, um, whatever they're called, something, neuroscience uh, in Melbourne. I want to create a global initiative, and I want to take all the images that we're creating of these individuals uh, with their brains at different points um, and make that available to researchers around the world so we can understand more about what's going on with individuals with learning difficulties. Like that, that is fundamentally a goal of our organization. Yeah. And we've just set up a foundation to um, uh, you know, try to raise some funds to support that. I'd like to create a research institute. Yes, uh, I'm not done. Uh, okay. Hi, Barbara. Um, I'm an occupational therapist, and I specialized in sensory processing. Mm -hmm. Being that reading the brain that changed itself mm -hmm. long years ago, met you there. Um, they were talking about you, and they were talking about a fast-forward program also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any information comparing this program compared mm -hmm. to yeah. yours? And well, interesting. Mike Mersnick, who is know. one of the developers of that program, we just had lunch the other day here, and in, in, uh, he's just retired from UCSF. Um, you know, what I would say and what he would probably say, I mean, Fast Forward is a really good program for acoustic temporal processing. So it's for those individuals, like, you know, when we hear speech, um, some individuals it sounds like noise because the, the part of the brain that parses speech into discrete sounds um, isn't working properly, right? So obviously if, if speech sounds kind of noisy or fuzzy, then when you go to try to read, you're not gonna be able to put um, sounds to the symbols. So it's a really good program for that. Um, the program, you know, I've, I developed a program for that area, but I think actually Fast Forward is a better program for that area. And then we have programs for 19 different cognitive functions. So you would say that uh, Fast Forward is like a basic, basic foundation yes, it is, it's for a understanding it's a, those cognitive concepts? Yes, right? it's, it's a, it's, it's a, I would say it's a capacity-based program. Like it comes out of neuroscience. What I did is comes out of neuroscience. There's also the CogMed program that comes out of neuroscience out of the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Um, so they're all, but they're, I would say the difference in Norman Deutsch, whose book you referenced, The Brain yeah. That Changes Itself, he travels all around the world. And currently, he says there's no program as comprehensive as what I've developed in terms of the broad range of cognitive oh, functions question. that it addresses. And, and, and it's probably because I had needs. I didn't have one area of difficulty. I had multiple areas. So one program would not have benefited me. I had to create all sorts of different programs. And then after I saw the benefits, I started talking to lots of other individuals with learning difficulties that weren't all the same as mine. And then I would go back into Lurie's work and try to figure out, okay, what isn't working for this person? And then I would create an exercise, and then we'd see, you know, was it doing um, what I thought it should do? And sometimes things ended up in the wastebasket. Um, but over a number of years, you know, developed a range of programs to address, you know, these, these different functions. One more question. Mm -hmm. uh, I ran my clinic for the last 15 years, and I get into a point where I need this kind of work for the mm -hmm. clients I'm working with. Mm -hmm. um, if I was to refer them to you, what would be a cost for six weeks program? The, the six week program, if they're coming up to Toronto, I think it's 5,000 Canadian dollars, which is like 12 cents in American. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Is the insurance covers any of it? Hmm? Insurance covers any of it? Uh, it doesn't. There, in Canada, not. I don't know. There might be coverage here, but 
in Canada there isn't coverage. I mean, in Canada you can get a medical tax credit um, for some of the, the, the fees that you pay. So it's different, I, whatever the regulations are here, there might be a possibility, I, I don't know. Um, and yes, and certainly we are starting to work you know, in clinics as well and, and provide some of the programs in clinics, so that might be a conversation to have with, with Debbie. Yeah. Hi. Um, we have a granddaughter who lives with us. She uh, went off to therapeutic boarding school at 11, and she's now at another therapeutic uh, school in Bend, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And we think she really does need probably what you have. The, the six-week program, do you take kids so that it's a boarding school? The Thai only boarding school is the one in the French Alps right now in Thailand. Okay. Thailand. And Thailand is a boarding school. And the sorry, board, Marine, yeah. you have one called Breen. Brem. Oh, Brem. Yes. Brem. Yes, Brem is a boarding school. And I it's do, they mostly... Don't, they don't offer the cognitive intensive program yet. They don't offer the six-week program. The six-week program. But so it's they, year round. they have a year-round program and really excellent. And that's how the researcher at Southern Illinois University got interested in our work because Bram is in Carbondale and Southern Illinois University is in Carbondale. So we started doing research on students there first and then we developed an agreement with Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto so he uses all that data now. Yeah, so it's a really good school. How long is the lead up to, you know, reaching out to you guys to getting things going? Yeah, it, it um, I think the shortest was like six weeks, which is really unusual. Sometimes it can be two years. So it, it really depends on, I mean, once an organization has decided they want to do it, we do training. Um, our training, we just finished training in Australia. Uh, so if a teacher or an individual is being trained in the full, all of the delivery, the assessment, it's a three-week training program. And we offered in Toronto, uh, I think it's early, like beginning of July into this, um, into August. Oh, for the, oh, for the kids? Yeah. Um, it, it depends on each organization. I mean, we're doing assessments. You know, we have a psychometrist on staff, so it's usually maybe two to three weeks before someone can get in uh, for an assessment, and it takes about a day, day and a half. Um, and then we have the learning profile for that, that individual. Uh, any of the schools, if you go on our website, aerosmithschool.org, there's participating schools and it will list the, the various schools around the world and majority of them offer assessment as well. Um, I really loved your example about the letter recognition um, capacity skill building you were doing uh, with the Armenian. I was wondering, do you have any examples of exercises that target working memory or processing speed yeah. or if not explicit examples that you could explain right now yeah. like on a website or anything? Um, well the one that Carly did is is um, affects processing speed, working memory. It's the one that I created for myself which is the clocks, right? So the idea is not about telling time but seeing relationships. So we start you know, processing two relationships, it's a two-handed clock, then uh, three, which is hour, minute, second, and then there's four, a fraction of a second, then six, then eight, and then ten handed. And ten, only two people have ever walked into my school in Toronto and looked at the ten handed clocks and been able to figure it out. And one uh, was an astronomer who was part of the group that discovered radio emitting galaxies, and the other one was a physicist from Harvard. So I figured I was on to something with that <laughs> exercise, you know, at that level. But but it's, it's like, and the idea is that students are working through, not everybody gets up to that 10-handed level. Like there's a certain point at which the functioning is solid and it's average, and then there's a choice. Do you want to continue going um, to build that into an incredible strength, or is it sufficient at that point? And then sometimes there are other areas um, so we don't have the luxury to continue on because we've got other things that are critical. Uh, and we do that in consultation with the, with the individual. You know, and, and you know, occasionally there are people that walk out the door when I think, you know, I'd like them for another year. But you know, they, they're happy to use the gains that they have. Yeah. I wouldn't be doing my public duty if I didn't tell you all right now. This program really changed my life. And if you have a kid with learning disabilities, I highly, highly, highly recommend looking into this program because it honestly changed my whole life. And I could not be more thankful for you, mm -hmm. honestly, because I wouldn't be where I am as a student today, as the person I am, without your program. Mm -hmm. And 
Honestly, I am so proud of the person I've become today because of this program. It is a part of me, and it's something I'm so proud to say I've done. Mm -hmm. And it changes you. It changes your life. It changed mine. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, after these questions, I'll be outside. I can answer some more. And Barbara's going to be signing books, and she can answer some more. So I'll, I think you get the lucky microphone. <laughs> It's a quick one. Okay. Uh, what about um, m mixing with other uh, like environment changes like nutrition? Absolutely. I think they're um, what I call sort of state factors. So good nutrition, good sleep, you know, meditation, exercise. We, we encourage. We don't include it. We, we, um, we try to incorporate some mindfulness into the program, some social, emotional learning into the program. The challenge is we're trying to do a lot with the cognitive exercises, so we encourage um, parents to have the children engage in other activities of things that we can't provide. Um, it's, it's really intense. Our goal is to get the students into the program, do what we need to do, and get them out of the program. So a student doesn't come with us to us in grade one and stay till grade eight. You know, they may be there for two or three or four years, and then they're back into the the regular school system. Yeah. Uh, can I, sorry, I, some people asked me for my cards, and I thought I ran out. I just found some more. I did hand out my colleague. She's very happy to answer questions. <laughs> um, but I, I'll have. To, I just found some more. So. All right, over to you. Yeah, okay. So I guess are we... Yeah, uh, good. Okay. So, yeah, thank you, Barbara. That was great.